so today I want to I want to take my time because I, I I feel an urgency to share the word that I have. How many of you have your Bibles with you? If you brought your Bible, let me see your Bible. Amen. That's awesome. I want you to open that Bible up to the 15th chapter of Romans. And I want you to open up your iPads. I want you to get your pencils and your pens out. I'm going to share a little bit with you today. I think it's something that's much needed in the kingdom of God. Um, I, I, what I sense in my spirit um, in this present time, and, and Lord help us all as the as the fivefold ministry, whether you be a pastor, an evangelist, apostle, a teacher, or a prophet, help us to be sensitive to the times. Help us to be sensitive to the needs of people. Not to get caught up in, in just doing church, but get but make sure that we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit and speak what he says to us. And I have something I want to speak to you today because I feel like we're, we're battling something in our nation. I feel like that the enemy is doing everything he can to rob men and women and children of hope. He's trying to steal people. So how many of you feel like the enemy's after your hope? You, you feel like that? You know, people are... There's, there's, there's a problem with drug addiction and alcoholism and all the things that people face because you know what people want to know? They want to have hope. They want to they have hope for the future, hope for tomorrow. What does tomorrow bring? What's it going to look like? And a lot of people have, are, are at the enemy. They feel discouraged. They feel hopeless. They feel like that and, and this kind of thing. But I've got news for you. There is hope. And, but here's what you need to understand. Hope doesn't come in a bottle. Hope doesn't come in a syringe. Uh, you can't shoot it in your veins. Come on, y'all. You can't drink it. You can't snort it. You can't smoke it. I can't get help in this Pentecostal church. You don't, that's not, hope comes in one person. It's in one person. And the Bible, I'm going to talk about hope today. And I want to talk about hope. You know, the, the world has one definition of hope. The, the, the world sees hope as one thing, but the Bible describes hope as something totally different. It's a different kind of understanding of what, of what hope uh, really is. In Matthew, or excuse me, in Romans chapter 15, the Bible says this, it opens up saying, and I want you to look at this on the screen, and I'm going to talk to you for a few moments today on the subject of healing and hopeful. I want to live my life every day healing, God doing, helping me with the problems from my past, healing me of my past, but also giving me hope for my future, amen? I want to live, touch your neighbor and say, I want to live healing and hopeful. Every day I'm healing from the things that have gone wrong in my past, every, the hurts of my past, the wounds of my past. I'm living every day healing. That's what Paul said, I forget those things which are behind me. I'm, I'm, I'm being healing, and there's, there's a renovation of my mind going on right now, amen? And I'm, I'm, I'm healing, but I'm also hopeful. I'm hopeful for what God has in my future. In Romans 15, 13, the Scripture said, may the God of hope. Somebody say the God of hope. The God of hope. He is a God of hope, y'all. Hope is found in him. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in. Now, this is what I want you to notice, these next two words. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in what? In believing. I want you, we're gonna we're gonna talk about the fact that hope and believing or hope and faith work together amen and 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 they are really they're synonymous we'll talk about that in just a moment may the god of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that the by the power of the holy spirit you may watch this now abound in hope not have a little bit of hope not a dab of hope but that you may live your life abounding in hope knowing that there's something good coming in your future. Amen? That God has something good for you. I also read a verse of Scripture in Proverbs 23 this week that I think is good. It's in 23:18, the Scripture said, Surely there is a future, and your hope will not be cut off. <laughs> your hope will not be cut off. I'm here to tell somebody today that you have been living 
in, in a place where you weren't sure about your future, I'm here to tell you by God's word that God is a God of hope, and your hope will not, in Jesus' name, it will not be cut off. Somebody give God praise because you know your hope. Your hope's not going to be cut off. But here's what I want you to understand. The distinctive meaning of hope in the Bible, in the Scripture, is almost the opposite of our ordinary usage of the word hope or the way we use the word hope. Let me say that again. The distinctive meaning of hope, what hope really means, is actually the opposite of how we use the word hope ordinarily. You say, Pastor, what do you mean? Let me give you a... When we, ordinarily when we express hope, we're expressing, a lot of times we're expressing uncertainty. You, you say, Pastor, what, what, let, me, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. For example, you might say, a child might say, you know what, I hope daddy gets home early tonight. I hope he does. Now, when they talk about hope there, that means that I hope he gets home, but, I, but I'm not certain he's going to get home early tonight. See, a lot of people are living with a hope that's uncertain. And that's what's causing us to, 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 to live in a place of anxiety and stress and fear and worry because we don't have that certainty that we need in our life. Another example would be is that maybe you'd say, I hope that Bill arrives safely. See, there's this, that's uncertain. It's not, it's not certain. Maybe, how many, how many of you fly? How many of you are flyers in here? How many of you like to fly? How many of you have understood by flying, you've heard it said that, that your plane will arrive on time at its destination if the tailwind is right? Amen? So maybe a, a good example is a good tailwind is our, you could say today a good tailwind is our only hope of arriving on time. Only hope. A good tailwind, but you're not sure. It's not certain. But here's what the, the Scripture says about hope. The Scripture defines hope as something totally different. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11, the Bible said, And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full, now watch this now, to have the full assurance. Everybody say assurance. To have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish but be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit promises. Wow. Full assurance. Now what does it mean what does the, the full assurance of hope mean in verse 11? What it means is, is it means hope which is fully assured and hope which is confident. That means that when, we, when, when, you, when you define hope by God's word, it's not something that you think is that God is in control of. It's not something you think God is doing. It's not something you hope. You know, when you talk about hope, it's not like the, the, the natural use of hope where, I, where, where you say, well, I, I hope God's up to something. But when you use a biblical hope, you can say, hey, you know what? God works all things out for my good and his glory, so he is up to something in my life. And I understand that Jeremiah 29, 11 says that God has a plan for my life, and he gives me a future and he gives me what hope I don't listen listen it's not a might or a maybe that God's up to something in my life you hear me it's not a might or a maybe that God's in control of tomorrow he is in control of tomorrow God does have a plan for my tomorrow God is up to something now do I know everything God's up to do I know all of God's plans for me 
Do I, does, does God lay it out every day like I want him to? Does he do it like I want him to? Does it look like I want it to look? Does it turn out every time like I want it to? No, but I can tell you this one thing. After 50 years of serving him, he has always done it like it needed to be done in my life, and he's always taken care of me. <laughs> Touch somebody next to you and say, he's the God of hope. So the full assurance is, is, is something different. See, when we talk about hope in the natural, a lot of times it's, it, it can be described as this. It, 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 biblical hope is not like it is in the, in the natural. We, we cross our fingers. You ever had somebody say, you know, they're, 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 they're believing for something to happen, and they put their hand behind their back and cross their fingers, and I just cross my fingers that it's going to happen. I don't know about you, but I'm not living like that. Look at somebody next to you with an attitude. Say, I'm not living like that. It's not, the hope I'm talking about today is not a finger-crossing hope. It's not a, it, it, the, the hope I'm talking about now, now and I'm going to get this, this, this will help you relate to it. It's not the lip-biting gaze as you watch the place kicker <laughs> go for a field goal in the last 10 seconds when you're down by two points. It's not like, you know, like some of you were on the edge of your seat yesterday. It was like that Alabama-Auburn game they had yesterday. And I hate to admit it. Don't tell the tech people I said this. But it was like the Georgia, Georgia Tech game yesterday. I don't know what happened to us. I'm just going to go tell everybody, though, this, I'm, this is my story. I'm going to stick to it. I'm just going to tell them we, we just didn't put our best men out there yesterday, all of our best. Y'all want to go with that? Let's go with that. We didn't put all of our best out there. We had some of our, but not all of our, all of our best, because we were saving it for a better game. Yeah, there's a few of you with me, some of you not. There's still a few Alabama fans in here. I'm praying for you. God's going to deliver you. <laughs> It's not a finger-crossing hope. It's not a lip-biting hope. In fact, watch what you said. Verse 12 implies this. Remember today, I'm going to teach you a little bit. Verse 12 implies so that you may not be sluggish. Look what it says. It implies that hope, it says, so you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through what? So what does verse 12 do? It implies that hope and faith are synonymous. Hope and faith. And faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not yet seen. Now, you got to understand, if you're going to get a revelation of Hebrews 11.1, 1, you got to get a revelation of the word evidence. That's what we've not understood, y'all. The most important word in Hebrews 11.1 1 is the word evidence. You know what the word evidence means? Proof. Hope is the proof. Hope is the certainty, not the uncertainty, not crossing your fingers, not biting your lip, hoping it's going to happen in the, as in the natural, but knowing that God is in control and God is going to work it out for his glory and my good. He's going to. He's going to. He's in control of tomorrow. Not Mike, not maybe. He is. It's going to be all right. Notice the connection. Verse 11 says, go hard after the full assurance of hope. And verse 12 says, the result of the pursuit of hope is that you will be like those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Pursue hope so that you can be like the men of faith. By faith, Abraham, by faith, Isaac, by faith, Sarah, by faith, Noah, by faith, the men of old lived their lives, trusted God, and God saw them through. Amen? By faith. There's a, there's a connection of faith and hope. Hope is saying, I Trust God with my future, and God has got my future. He's in control. He's taking care of it. 
Let me tell you something. A lot of the worry, the anxiety, the stress will go away when we can understand God's got it. Look at me. You need to hear somebody say, God's got it. Quit worrying about it. God's got it. Quit stressing over it. God's got it. Quit allowing all of this to overcome you and overwhelm you because God's got it. He's going to take care of you. Pursue hope so that you can be like the men of faith. Let's look at this connection between hope and faith a little further. The term full assurance, everybody say full assurance. If you're taking note, that, 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 that phrase, that term full assurance there used in verse 11 is the Greek word, it's from the Greek word plerophorian. Plerophorian. It's spelt like this if you're putting it in your notes. P L E R O P H O R I A N. Plerophorian. And it's found one other place in the book of Hebrews. It's found also in Hebrews chapter 10, and verse 22. However, in Hebrews 10, 22, it is the full assurance of faith instead of the full assurance of hope. It says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. That's the full assurance of faith. Then, in the next verse, it says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope, watch this now, without wavering. Now, we're going to stop right there for just a moment. Let us hold fast, everybody say hold fast, the confession of our hope without what? Without wavering. You know what the Bible says that, that, that Abraham did? The script, the Bible says, Abraham staggered not. That's what the King James Version, it uses the word stagger. It said that he staggered not in his faith in believing that God would do what he said he would do. He didn't stagger. He didn't waver. Let me tell you something. What this generation needs more than any other time is to know that they can trust God. Young people know they, need to know they can trust God. And let me tell you something, y'all. Either we believe God or we don't believe God. And it's time for holy, you know, we, we claim a lot of stuff. We're saved. How many saved in this room? Raise your hand if you're saved. I'm saved. I'm born again. How many of you sanctified? Let me see here. How many? No, yeah, no not as many sanctified. That's right. <laughs> How many Holy Ghost feel? Let me see your hand. Holy Ghost feel. Holy Ghost feel. Fire baptized. I speak in tongues. I, you know, I'm, I'm more than y'all. Like Paul, man. You just, you, I mean, you got the whole thing, man. You the whole nine yards. You full gospel. Amen. All right, but, then, and, and, but, but here's what I don't understand is that we're for gospel, we're full of faith and, 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 and we trust God and, and all these kind of things. But so, and so here, here's what we got to do. You can't, you cannot, you cannot talk about hope, biblical hope, but then walk out worldly hope in front of your children. What our kids need, and especially your, your smaller children, when they come in, and even, even your, your teenagers, you know what I'm saying? And they come in, and, they, and, they're, they're, and, and, and even in their 20s, and even, you know, older, and they come in your house, and they sit down beside you, or they crawl up in your lap, or whatever they do, and they say, hey, is, is everything going to be all right? Mama, is everything, look at me, look at me, moms and dads, is everything going to be all right? Are we going to make it? You see, what you don't understand is they're living in a social media world and they're living in a world where the news is popping up every other second and telling them what's going on around the world and all the negatives of the world and your children, you wonder, and we wonder why they're living with the anxiety and the stress and the worry. God help us as spirit-filled believers when our children climb up in our laps and they ask us, is it going to be okay? Well, honey, just cross your fingers. <laughs> Huh? Well, I hope so, baby. 
No, you know what you do? When they climb up in your lap, grab the Word of God and say, yes, ma'am, it's going to be all right. Yes, sir, it's going to be all right because according to God's Word, He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He walks with us all the way, even unto the end. Anybody believe God in His Word today? Give Him a praise like you know God is a God of hope. Not a might, not a maybe, not a possibly. The children of Israel got in a mess when they wouldn't talk about the goodness of God. They got in a mess when they forgot their testimonies. Huh? Share your testimonies with your children. They want to hear them. Let me go ahead and mess y'all up. How many baby boomers do we have in this, this room today? Those are people born between... Uh, 1940, what, and, and it ended like 64, 1964. You're a baby boomer. You're in the late 40s, the early 60s, that born in that time frame. Raise your hand. Let me see your hand. It's okay. I know some of you don't want to give your age away. You don't look it. It's okay. You look 29 still yet. We'll tell you that. Make you feel good. We'll speak those things that are not as though they were just for you. Amen. <laughs> but look, look, I read something interesting this week. As I was just doing some just just some basic research about things, I decided to, you know, I was just researching the church and where we were and what what the, you know what what they're saying, what people are saying about the church and and how effective the church is and all these kind of things. But I read something interesting that was it can be it might you know some people can look at it as negative. I don't look at it as negative. I look at it as positive. I mean. It's something that we can, there's some things we could straighten out in it, but I, 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 there's one part of it that really just excited me. And you know what I read this week? I read that Generation Z. Now, who is that? Raise your hand if you're Z. Okay, and that's from where to where. What is that? Anybody know for sure? I, I can't remember exactly what it said, but just young. It's young. <laughs> All right, let's just say it's young. When you're this Generation Z, like somebody that's, that's Generation Z, raise your hand again. Where, where you at? What year was you born? 04. Really? <laughs> uh, 04. Good Lord. After 2000. <laughs> 04. <laughs> I was born in 1968. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Look at you. She's so beautiful. Listen here. How many else? Generation Z, raise your hand. When was you born? 2011. Generation Z, the, this, is, this is not what the Bible says. This is what statistics say. They've done research and said that the most spiritual generation alive right now are the people, not, no, 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 let me not say it like that. Not the most spiritual, but the people who are searching out and are hungry for spiritual things more than any other generation is Generation Z. This is what they're saying. They're going to church more. Look at them. Look at it over here, y'all. Rusty said, I'm going to sneak over here in Generation Z. <laughs> hey, that's a smart thing to do right there. Amen. Stay young. We're going to stay young. Me and Rusty's after it. Amen. Listen. They said that they're hungry more for spiritual things and for, for deeper things spiritually than generations past. The sad part about it is if you raised your hand and you were the, you were the baby boomer generations, what that other generation is, they're saying that the baby boomers are the ones who have moved away from the church in the last few years since COVID. Make some sense out of that. But see, here's what you, here's what you need to understand. The gener this present generation of young people are the ones who have fought harder with anxiety, stress, and worry in recent years. What has it done for them? It's drove them toward the church. Y'all better hear me. It's done what it, 
it, they've, they've went the direction that we're supposed to go. In other words, they say, oh, I, I, I thought this generation, you know what? They're moving away from, from, from the, 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 the drug thing and the alcohol thing day by day. Doesn't mean that some of them are not still going that way, but they're moving day by day further away from that and more to the spiritual because they've tapped into something on the inside. Y'all better hear what I'm talking about. Something that the world can't give you. I came to preach today. Something the world can't give you and the world can't take away from you. Yeah. Hear me today. Somebody said, my God, I've never been to a church where the pastor stood in the, up in the front row. It, if I knew I wouldn't hurt myself, I'd try to stand on the back of this chair. Listen, they're hungry. They've tapped into their inner man, finding out that there's something deep down inside you that'll give you a peace that passes all understanding, something you can't buy, something you can't snort, something you can't shoot in your pain, something you can't smoke, something you can't drink. It's something on the inside of you. They're hungry for spiritual things. Amen. And you know what they're doing? You know what I'm finding out? You know what I'm finding out? I'm finding out that young people are starting to challenge their parents. Huh? You know who's been making the appointments with me lately? You know who's been talking to me about the baptism in the Holy Ghost? The power of God? Young people. They want to talk to me about the book of Acts. Huh? And they're, they're the ones challenging their parents. They're challenging people around them. How come you ain't never read the book of Acts to me? I had somebody make an appointment with me recently, spent an hour and a half in my office, a young guy in his 20s, raised in a church that didn't talk about the book of Acts. They didn't talk about the gifts of the Spirit. They didn't talk about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They didn't talk about the dunamis power that we talk about in this church. They're hungry for it. They want a move of God. They want to see the glory of God, the power of God. They know, I wish I could get somebody in this room to help me. Praise the Lord in this room today. I'm telling you that you can find a hope. You can find a peace. You can find an anointing. You can find a confidence in God that you can't find anybody, anywhere else. Somebody praise God because you know God's in control and you can trust God when you can't trust anything else. Come on, slap three people around you, high five and say, trust God, baby, trust God. Trust God. Trust God. Trust God. I'm living in healing and hopefulness. Say, Pastor, are you done yet? No, I'm not. Full assurance. Full assurance of, of faith. Full assurance of hope. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Then in the next verse it says, let us hold fast the confession of faith. Now this is what I want you to get. Don't you miss this. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is what? He's what? What is he, y'all? He's faithful. What does it mean? That means God does what he says he'll do. That means God is who he says he is. That means when he says that he will withhold no good thing from you, you can trust him. The scripture says in more than one place, he is a God that cannot lie. Come on, touch somebody next to you and say, he can't lie. Get down. Yeah, get those singers ready. We're going to sing some more of that song y'all sang today. That song lit me up. How many of y'all got lit up? It lit me up today. Listen, y'all sat in front of a TV yesterday for three hours and watched a bunch of grown men running around in helmets and pads running into each other and acted crazy. Then you're going to get to church and try to rush everybody out because you got to go somewhere and go eat.
We get out a lot earlier than we used to. Y'all know that's a fact. But today I'm going to, I'm going to get done with what I'm going to say here. Because God's got something he wants to do in somebody's life. Now I want you to get this. He's faithful. What does that mean? He does what he said he would do. Let me give you an example. You got that Bible on your lap? Turn it to the New Testament. <clears throat> Everybody tell me what that first book is in the New Testament. What is it? What's that next one? What's that next one? What's that next one? What are those called? They're called what? The Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, and the Gospel of John. The Gospel of Matthew and his eyewitness account of the life of Jesus. Mark's, the Gospel of Mark, the eyewitness of the life of Jesus. Luke and John, four people. Let me tell you something. If you can take four eyewitnesses to, to you with court this afternoon, you'll win any case. If you can take four with you. You know what these four guys agree on? They agree on the fact that Jesus did not lie to them. You know what he told them? He said, you know what? I'm going to be with you for a short while. Then they're going to crucify me. They're going to hang me on a cross. They're going to put me in a borrowed tomb, and I'm going to lay there for three days. And then I'm going to get up out of that grave. I'm going to raise from the dead. I'm going to go, and I'm going to ascend into heaven. That's what he told them. That's what he promised them. Everything Jesus told these men he would do, guess what he did? He did it. Everything he said he was, guess what he was? He was. Because this is what I read. I read that after Jesus was there for three days, he got up on the third day. Here's what you need to realize. The Bible says that the first people that went to the tomb to check on Jesus, the stone had been rolled back. An angel came, was sitting up on that rock. What did that angel say to him? He said, you know, you seek Jesus, the one that was crucified. But you know what? He has risen, risen, risen. How? What do you say next? Huh? Just like he said he was. Just like he said. It wasn't put in the Bible. That's not in the Bible by mistake. It's there to prove to you that he does just what he says he will do. And there were witnesses that saw it. That he does what he said he would do. He is what? He's faithful. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. How do I hold fast? How do I do it? without wavering. Here's what I need you to understand. It has nothing to do with your, how much faith you have. It has more to do with what you put your faith in. Let me say it again. Hold fast the confession of your hope without wavering for, notice that word for. The, that means here's the reason that I'm going to hold fast. Here's the reason I'm going to hold fast to my confession. Here's the reason I'm going to do it without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. I can stand in confidence today because I serve a God who is faithful. I stand without wavering because God is faithful. I stand here today and tell you he's faithful. Watch this. In September of 1974, 
in South Dalton, Georgia, in an old metal building, not, not metal like they make now, I'm talking about old scrap metal kind of building that they had built, and old metal chairs inside there. No padding on those chairs. Just a few old metal chairs. My dad started a mission work in South Dalton, Georgia. We didn't even, we didn't have, we didn't have plumbing in the church. Had to go next door to the people's house and use the bathroom. Get water. Hello, somebody. One night, I was five years old. I didn't know exactly what I was doing, but I knew what I felt. An altar invitation was given. I was five years old, and I got up and knelt in a metal chair in that old mission church in South Dalton. I gave my heart to the Lord when I was five. Today, y'all, I'm 55. And you know what I can do? I can testify like David now. Back here when I was five, God was faithful. And here's, here's a 50-year journey I'm on. I've been on this 50-year journey. Over there, I was five. Over here, I'm 55. And I can say with the psalmist David, I once was young, and now I'm older. And along this way, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, and I've never seen God's seed begging for bread. I want somebody young to know God's faithful. God will take care of you. God will get you through anything. Nothing you're facing right now, God can't help you with. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's all not present, and he will get you through this thing. Anybody know the faithfulness of God? Anybody been through something and God got you through it? Take the next 60 seconds and give God the best praise you've given him all day because God see you here. Trey, ain't that your name? Come out here, buddy. I didn't see you was here. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Tell these folks how old you are, Trey. I am 21 years old. 21 years old. When I look at Trey, Trey and I have different backgrounds. Trey's not afraid to tell you. He's talked to me on many occasions comes from a Baptist background. He's Baptist Coastal now, y'all. Amen. <laughs> That's it. Loves God. Full of the Spirit of God. Lay hands on you anytime you get ready for him to lay hands on you. Amen. 21 years old. You know what's really inspired me about him? Because when I look at Trey at 21, although he comes from a different background than I did, I was raised Pentecostal. He's got the same hunger for the things of God that I had when I was 21. The same when I was preaching the gospel all over the, the southeastern United States. I was an evangelist. Man, I would, I'm telling you, I was all in. And what's happened is it's, it's young men like this and many more that are over there sitting in young women. I mean, we got a lot of women full of young women full of the Holy Ghost that, that, that they're just hungry for God. They want more of God. And it's, it's encouraged me and it's inspired me to go back where I started. Where all this started from with a hunger and a thirst. To go back to, you know, I used to sit in church and when my preacher shared the word with me and he gave me a word from the Lord, you know what I did? I just believed it. Huh? Let me tell you what you need to be aware of. Beware of those people that the enemy has strategically placed around you that question your faith. Now, I want you to get this. They're not there to question your faith. They're there to question your faith to get you to question your faith. You get it? They're placed around you. Oh, does God really do that? And let me tell you something. Here's the thing I want y'all to understand. Here's what everybody's saying. Pastor, you talk about Moses. You talk about Abraham. You talk about Sarah. You talk about Isaac. You talk about all these people. And those are Old Testament people. That's Old Testament promises. That, all that stuff that God told Abraham was Old Testament. 
God gave you that Bible for you to read it. If you're reading it, you'd know better than that. Blow the dust off that thing and read it every once in a while. Because Galatians chapter 3, New Testament says, if you, if you are in Christ, then you are heirs to the same promise of Abraham. Oh, I can't get no help in here. The Old Testament God is the same New Testament God. I want y'all to hear me today. From Genesis to Revelation, he's the same God. Yesterday, today, and forever. What God did then, God will still do now. I want somebody to raise some faith in this house today because somebody's going to get a miracle if you'll just trust it. Somebody's going to get a miracle. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to give an altar invitation. Now, listen, this is what I want you to do. I don't want you to wait on people. I want you to look around somebody else. You know who you are. If you're in this room today and you say, Pastor, I want, I want my faith to grow. I want, I want, my, I want to, my confidence in God to grow. I want this biblical hope you're talking about. I want it to be stronger than it's ever been in my life. I want that. I've been struggling a little bit. I've been going through some things in my life. And I want my faith to grow today. You know what we're going to pray? We're going to pray the same prayer that Jesus prayed for Peter. He said, Peter, I'm going to pray for your faith. <laughs> That your faith won't, your faith won't give out. I'm gonna pray for your faith. I'm gonna pray for your faith to grow. If you're one of those people, now I'm gonna tell you something. There's dozens of people that just you probably. When I say it, you should probably should just turn chairs over, running down here. You need to get down to this altar today and say, Hey, you know what? I want my faith to grow. There's something I need God to do. I need a miracle in my life. Get out of your seat and come stand with me, Amen. Because me and Trey gonna pray for you.